quiet. And sometimes they can be so focal that if you don't put your stethoscope on the right spot, you'll miss it completely. But they're quiet, so like I said, you have two doctors in a room disagree because one can hear and the other one can't. Grade twos. These are soft, but if there's activity in the room, you can miss it. So these are the ones, if you've ever seen the vet listening to a patient and the owner's talking in the background and they kind of put their hand up and walk out of the room with the dog, they're trying to hear whether or not there's a murmur or if this patient is just breathing. So these are soft, they're very focal, so I can't hear it on the other side of the chest. And if there's activity in the room, I might miss this one because I might mistake it for breathing sounds or I may not hear it. Grade threes are kind of a moderate intensity. And one example somebody's given me is, it's about the same intensity as the closure of the valves. So it's not a loud murmur, but it's easily heard. Now, if you move your stethoscope too far cranial, too far caudal, or to the, the opposite side of the chest, you might not be able to hear this one either. So that's kind of my criteria for loudness. If I can't hear it on the other side of the chest, then it's less than a grade four. So grade fours are loud, and usually they radiate to the other side of the chest. So I can hear it clearly on, if I can hear it clearly on the left, but I can hear it a little bit on the right, then it's at least a grade four. So it's a loud murmur. Grade fives, got to use your hands for this one. So you got to put your hands on the chest, and what you're going to feel is what we call the palpable thrill. So it's a reverberation of the murmur that you're actually feeling on your hands. So when, you, when we bring up our victims this afternoon, you're going to feel a precordial beat. If your patient is alive, they should all have a precordial beat, but the, the thrill is an additional reverberation based upon the murmur. It's kind of like for those of you that have had band, if you think about hitting a snare drum, you get that reverberation after you hit the drum. It's the same principle. Grade six. These suckers are so loud that you can take your stethoscope just off the chest wall and actually hear the murmur. If you want to play a party trick, if you have a patient that has a, a PDA and it's loud, you put it on top of the, the patient's head and sometimes they'll radiate to the head and you can actually hear the murmur on top of their head. So that, that's just a degree of loudness. All right, along with grading our murmurs, if I'm talking to the cardiologist on the phone, I need to use my shorthand to get my cardiologist to what I'm thinking. So I want to localize and give a point of maximal intensity. So I might say that it's loudest at the left apex, but it's radiating to the right. Um, I want to determine the phase. Is it diastolic or systolic? Since you guys are learning, I'll give you this helpful hint. Most of the murmurs that we escult in our patient are systolic. So if somebody says, was it diastolic or systolic? And you're not sure, you can get systolic. And you'll probably be right. So when in doubt, just guess systolic. Um, and as I mentioned, you can say it's either focal or it radiates. So if I'm talking to the cardiologist on the phone and I say I have a 14-year-old male neuter uh, Yorkshire Terrier that has a grade 4 out of 6 systolic murmur um, at the left apex that's radiating to the right. They're going to go, oh, okay, you have a, a Yorkie with mitral valve disease because I've described all of the characteristics that are consistent with a dog that has mitral valve disease. Some of it's breed, I gave you a small breed, gave you an old dog, and then I gave you the, the location where mitral valve disease occurs and the phase in which that occurs. I say I have a two-year-old intact male boxer that's febrile and I have a diastolic murmur um, at the left heart base, they're gonna go, oh, you need to stick a, an ultrasound probe on this guy's heart and see if he's got a bright aortic valve leaflet. Maybe this guy has a um, valvular endocarditis. So being able to use this language to localize disease will help you if you're talking to the cardiologist to be able to say, succinctly, this is where I found my lesion. And then they can help you with the rest of it. 
All right, so cardiology nerd speak. Good question. Okay. So my question is, can you determine if the radius or the waves the radiation, the radiating bit means I hear it loudest in one space, but I think I hear it somewhere else. So my point of maximal intensity is on the left, but I hear a murmur on the right. It's possible that there may be a separate murmur on the right, but if I think my, my murmur is loud enough on the left to radiate to the right, then that's where it's radiating. Some of this is cardiology nerd speak. You hang out with cardiologists long enough, they get into how they want to describe things, and if you want to go down that pathway, you can join them. So there are going to be some other things. They talk about things like an early systolic murmur or a late, or it comes in mid-systole. These are things I'm not going to expect your novice ears to pick up on. This is after listening to lots and lots of hearts over years that you start going, oh, that is, that is kind of a mid-systolic murmur. Cardiology nerd speak. If you go off to do a, an externship with a cardiologist, they're going to talk about all these things. No need to feel dumb. It's cardiology nerd speak. Mm -hmm. They're going to say things like holosystolic and pansystolic. What they mean by that is holosystolic means that the intensity doesn't change during systole. It's not going whoosh, whoosh. it's just whoosh, 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 whoosh. that's all they mean. It's just the same intensity. Pansystolic means it's occurring throughout systole. So instead of hearing a lug before you hear the dub, you just get shh, 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 shh. So you're not getting a, a good lug before that sound. That's all they need. Diastolics are going to come. They're going to be the murmurs that sound wrong. So after years of hearing systolic murmurs, the first time you hear a diastolic murmur, you're going to go, it's a murmur, but it's wrong. <laughs> you're not going to quite know why it's wrong, but it's like a murmur that's off beat. So they kind of go, love, shh. I'm sorry, love, dub, shh. Love, dub, shh. Love, dub, shh. Most of the murmurs you're going to hear go, shh, dub, shh, dub, shh, dub, shh, dub. All right, we're going to listen to some murmurs. All right, so we talk about our regurgitant murmurs. Here's a holosystolic. All right, we'll play it again. You're going to hear love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub, and then you're going to hear a in the background. Love dub in the background. So you hear that in the background. That's your moment. Alright, play your pants systolic. Sounds even better. So that in the background, that's your murmur. You can still hear a love dub. So I think it's mainly because uh, you're, you're getting a nice recorded sound. Dr. Martin? Yes. Can you play them one more time? In the background, you're still getting the love dub, but the, the is going throughout. So you're like, oh, okay, I might not really hear the love dub because I'm hearing it. starting point. When you hear a murmur, the first time you hear a murmur, you're going to be like, I hear a murmur! And then you can go back and figure everything else out. What was your question? So the part is short. Versus the, the pants is solid is like
Don't worry, you'll get it. All right, so the more cardiology nerds speak, they'll talk about regurgitant murmurs versus ejection murmurs. Now, the thought process is that the regurgitant murmur has less of a velocity, so it does it, it tends to have a lower frequency versus your ejection murmurs, which tend to have a higher frequency. The, the thought process, again, is it's like whistling. So if you have a narrow orifice that something is passing through, it's going to give it a higher pitch. Again, cardiology nerds speak, and if you listen to enough hearts, you might be able to go, oh, okay, I get why that's regurgitant versus an injection type sound. So we consider the pulmonic stenosis, subaortic stenosis, they tend to be more ejection murmurs. So in that one, you couldn't really hear love doves, but you could actually hear the patient breathing in the background. VSD, if, since the pressure is higher going from the left side to the right side, sometimes those will actually sound louder on the right. So just one of those helpful hints. All right. For diastolic murmurs, they tend to be more musical, so they talk about them having kind of a decrescendo sort of sound. And so what you get is a higher intensity at the beginning and it kind of dies off. This is the one that sounds wrong. So it's like a murmur, but it's offbeat. Diastolic murmurs, first time you hear diastolic, you're going to be like, it's a murmur, but it sounds wrong. Don't worry, you'll get it. All right. PDAs. Looking at our diagram, our pul pulmonary artery is way up at the heart, um, at the thoracic inlet. So this is where it's going to be loudest. If you, in ascolting your puppies and kittens when they come for their visits, if you're not ascolting the area of the thoracic inlet, you might miss these guys because it sounds like a bunch of noise in the chest, but you can't really localize it because it's not a, a shh sort of sound. It actually sounds kind of like a washing machine that's just running in the background. being in this room when the air conditioning is running in the background, we just kind of like tune it out. If you're listening over the valves, it's just noisy in the chest, but you can't quite explain it. When you move your stethoscope to that thoracic inlet, it gets louder. You're like, oh, is that a PDA? So, but you gotta listen in the right spot or else you're gonna miss it because it doesn't have that shh, 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 shh murmur sound. So you gotta know to listen at that um, thoracic inlet. Alright, these sounds also have shapes. 
So if you have a fancy schmancy stethoscope that records sounds, you can have your, your sounds Bluetooth to your computer and it'll run through a program and it'll give you a shape. And so the computer can actually tell you, if you say, this is where my stethoscope was located, it can tell you what type of murmur your patient has. So that can be helpful if you're hearing impaired or if you have something weird and you're just like, I don't know what the heck this is, you record the sound, that might be something that you can share with a cardiologist later on. And we can see most of our, our murmurs are systolic in nature. So that helps us go, okay, all the common things, these are going to be on the systole side. Um, your patent that this is going to be both, and your diastolic murmurs are going to be that. If you get a patient that has a to and fro, so they have a subaortic stenosis and an aortic insufficiency, then we'll get kind of a shh, shh, well, sort of sound when we listen to these patients. All right, lastly, pulmonary auscultation. You'll see some variations and some people will do like a hashtag grid. Um, that probably works better in your large animals, but if you're listening to a chihuahua, they don't really have that much. So if you can basically separate them into quadrants. So we wanna say, and this is our, our dorsal, this is our ventral, this is our caudal, this is our cranial, and then we have left and right. So, um, sculpting my patients, certainly if they have any noises or crackles right where this circle is, then that's hyalur in nature. So if I hear crackles in this region, then it, I might have some uh, congestive heart failure in my patient. But if I'm describing something to a colleague over the phone and I say that I'm when I'm sculpting the chest, the right um, cranioventral quadrant and I hear pulmonary crackles, they're going to go, oh, you have a patient with aspiration pneumonia. So being able to localize our sounds to one of those quadrants can help us to identify and localize where our disease is located. All right, so when you bring your critters up, we're going to have a station that is pulmonary auscultation. We're going to have another station that's cardiovascular auscultation. And then we're going to have a third station for ECG. Any questions? All right, we're going to count off, starting in the front, on, on the far, on my far right. Two, one. There are only three stations. Send me a representative from each of your groups.